great pleasure to introduce John Fitzpatrick, uh, someone who is extraordinarily busy but always has time for Archibald, for which we will be, uh, w w for which we continue to be deeply grateful. Uh, some of you may know, but not everyone, that John actually started here as an intern, as a student intern in the 70s. So he has a very long track record at Archibald um, and started the project on Florida Scrub Days then. And I think this may be the first year he has ever missed being here for the spring breeding season. I'll have to check him on that, but it's certainly the first year in many years because of the COVID restrictions. So we're very happy to have him here virtually, if not in person. Uh, John was executive director here at Archville from 88 to 95, and then um, uh, went on to head up the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, or the Lab of O, for those of you who know the, the friendly acronym. Uh, where he's done extraordinary things in terms of propelling the lab to be sort of the um, just the eminent organization around the world for birds. I'm going to let uh, Reed Bowman, who is the head of our avian ecology, introduce, um, introduce John's talk for you. I'll give a slight correction. I think John is going to talk and to give us just, you know, a 50 minute talk, and then it will be available to ask questions until about 4.45, so we'll manage that. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Reed Bowman and ask you to introduce, uh, introduce today's talk. And again, thank you very much, John. We really appreciate this. Pleasure. Thank you, Hillary. Um, well, it's a, pre it's a real privilege to introduce Fitz. I've known him for a, a very long time. Um, even before I first met Fitz, I knew him by reputation. He had studied New World tyrant flycatchers and Florida scrub jays. Uh, and I came to Archbold in 1990 because my PhD advisor was Len Wolfen and his long-term collaborator. And Fitz gave me a job in 1991. But one of the first things that impressed me about Fitz is one of the first tasks that Fitz gave me was to go out into the wilds of Highlands Hammock State Park and survey for ivory-billed woodpeckers. <laughs> and to me, that was suddenly this insight that Fitz had this deep dedication and went beyond just his study species to all birds and their conservation and more importantly their history even. He knew that Highlands Hammock was one of the last places that ivory-billed woodpeckers had occurred in North America. Um, and, and probably reflecting that, Fitz is actually the only person in the history of the American Ornithological Society it's won three of their major awards, the Brewster Award for Research, an award for the Schreiber Award for Conservation, but also an award for service to the society. And again, I think it's that, that dedication to the society because the society is how we further ornithology, which is one of Fitz's deepest and longest interests. So this talk is, is founded on the premise of eBird, and uh, Fitz himself even called eBird an audacious idea. But it's actually more than that because it was an incredibly timed product. Fitz realized that he had to have a product that would be perfect for the birders of the world. There are birders and there are ornithologists and their needs and motivations differ a little bit. Well, he came up with a perfect product for birders a place to compile lists and a list for every single location you bird and a way to compile all this information from your phone so you could do it on the spot immediately. Of course, he also knew what the needs of ornithologists were. So in fact, by developing eBird, he created a product that met the needs of both communities perfectly. And I don't know if he truly had the vision of where eBird would go to, but knowing Chris, he did. And uh, he actually is the holder of the patent for eBird, and he will be the first one to confess that it's a huge team effort. But I honestly believe that there is nobody alive that can speak about the data and the insights and the future impact that eBird can have, not only on our appreciation of birds, but on their preservation and conservation than John Fitzpatrick. So John, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Reed. Um, I'm not seeing humans on the screen, so just let me know. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yes, you're great. Okay, good deal, thank you. 
Uh, thanks very much, Reed and Hillary. Um, thanks for inviting me to do this. Um, as Hillary mentioned, indeed, Archbold Biological Station is a, is a huge place in my heart, in my life, and in the life of our two kids and Molly. Um, this is the first spring since 1973 that I have not been down there uh, during the mapping season. Uh, but um, I'll be getting down at some point later this summer, I hope, to check on Reed's work. Um, and you'll see a few slides on into this presentation that gives you a little sense of just uh, w one aspect of why we do such a careful job of mapping these uh, Florida scrub jay territories. But, f but uh, on to the, uh, to the main topic here, which is much broader than the jays. It really has to do with this title, which, uh, believe it or not, I take seriously and believe literally. And I hope that uh, over the course of the next hour, I'll give you a sense of, of what I mean by this um, sort of odd idea. Um, it starts with the fact that, uh, that we know, now for some reason I am frozen here. It's not advancing. I'm uh, still looking at the title slide, which I assume you are too, right? Shoot, I'm, uh, and I'm having trouble exiting. You're still seeing the first slide, right, Laura? Yes, sir. Shoot, well, I'm gonna stop sharing here for a minute. Hello again, everybody. I, I now see humans. Um, <laughs> Let's see if we can make this work the second time around. Are you back on? Yes, sir. Uh, for some reason, I'm not advancing. I've never had this happen before. Hmm. Sorry about the technicals here. I'm gonna try uh, getting out of a couple of these options in here. Pardon me for this. Weird, it's not advancing. For some reason, it's getting into screen share mode and it's just hovering. There we go. So something's, something's, something might have given there. Um, I'll skip that other slide. It was a spoon-billed sandpiper that uh, introduces the concept, which uh, is uh, well known to all of you, that Earth is at a cusp. We are at a major turning point in the history of the planet uh, with 7 billion human beings heading towards 8 billion the big question uh, exists in all of our minds, is it possible for us to coexist over the long term on this planet side by side with stable and intact natural systems? I hypothesize that everybody in the world would like that to be true, uh, but it's not gonna happen by accident. If it's going to happen, if we're gonna live side by side with intact natural systems around the planet, it's gonna have to be true that all the cultures and generations of the world must embrace this value. They must want it to be true. And number two, and more immediately uh, relevant to today's talk, we need real-time measures to, to be proxies, to help us gauge how well we're doing uh, in the process of getting close to that ideal. And it comes as no surprise to you that I regard birds as we regard birds as the most important tool for both of those things, for, for uh, engaging humans around the world and for giving us a way of measuring how we're doing. I talk about this in, in, the, in the context of power because indeed birds have enormous powers. Um, they're unique in the natural world, in fact, for having four powers that, uh, that I recognize. First of all, and it has been recognized for centuries that birds are superb models for how nature works. It's no accident that 
most of the major principles in ecology, evolutionary biology, natural resource management, and so on, had as their origins uh, people studying birds. Uh, heck, Leonardo da Vinci uh, wrote a whole treatise on bird flight uh, back in the Middle Ages. So they're wonderful scientific tools. That's why there are so many ornithologists in research universities around the world. But they're also extremely important environmental indicators, and we'll get into this in some uh, detail in a few minutes. But as bird populations change, they show us some things that are happening on the underlying ecosystems. And so they can represent real barometers of uh, ecological change that turn out to be very important for us in terms of figuring out how to manage our natural systems. Thirdly, they uh, migrate by the billions a couple times each year across the entire face of the planet. And in this context, they really are the heartbeat of the global annual cycles. And by measuring this heartbeat, by measuring birds as they move and as their numbers change, we can actually get a real sense of how the Earth's uh, annual cycles are, are uh, changing, how the seasonal cycles are changing, and so on. And finally, and I would argue maybe most important of all, birds appeal to our spiritual side. They, everybody loves birds. They appeal to our emotions. Poets and playwrights and musicians for centuries have included birds in their artistic works. So birds sing to us in very spiritual and emotional ways. They engage us with nature, regardless of how much we know about nature. They make us want to be involved. We love having birds around us and every culture in the world does so. So I, one of the things I love to do at the beginning of a talk is just illustrate the fact that you don't need to know anything at all about birds to love them. Uh, and there's lots of ways to illustrate it. And I've chosen for this talk to pick a, a little sequence of uh, film that has come out of our work on the uh, birds of paradise in New Guinea. Uh, this is uh, the superb bird of paradise. And I'm just gonna show you uh, in the next, uh, next slide, and as possible, this is gonna be pretty jumpy because I, I did get out of the optimized mode here. Um, actually, hang on a minute. I'm going to risk everything and stop the share. I'm going to go into the share and I'm going to optimize for sound and video. And now let's watch this video. And just enjoy it. What the heck is he doing? All you guys out there, we could do this, right? Backwards too. Now that amazing clip is just an illustration that you don't need to know anything about birds to appreciate them. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what that was. What you wa were watching there was a, a male, obviously displaying to the female, and you want to think, well, you know, you want to have sex with you. She said, don't you want to have sex with me, make a baby? And actually what he's doing is, you want to have sex with me? And she's saying, eh, I've got others out there. I'm going to go check them out. I'll be back at you if, uh, if it turns out you're the best one. Uh, so it's an amazing little scene that plays out uh, in these lecking birds in, uh, in New Guinea. Um, and we're going to move on. No, we're going to move on. 
And now coming to the real world of what the birds of paradise also tell us, they tell us more than just the spectacular show of what sexual selection can do in nature. They actually hark back to the days in the 1800s in which a number of them became extremely rare because we were harvesting them by the millions to decorate the hats of, uh, of women across high society in Europe and North America. So they, are, well, they were one of the earliest uh, groups of birds in which we were paying attention to the fact that humans are actually causing the, uh, the slow decline of birds in nature. Of course, they are only one of many such stories. The most severe such story of all is the one of our own passenger pigeon, which was at one point the world's most abundant bird, probably five billion or more. In fact, Audubon and Wilson both observed flocks that they estimated that it could have been up to five billion birds with a B in the flock. And of course, by the end of the 1800s, we had taken every last one of them. We had taken them all. And the, this picture is the only one I've ever found of the market hunters that were responsible for the demise of the passenger pigeon. And by this time, 1888, you can see that they were mainly selling cranes and geese and ducks of a variety of species. And there on that post, the sad little remnants of the passenger pigeon harvest uh, that had been by the hundreds of millions only a decade or two before. And the question we have to keep asking ourselves when we think about the passenger pigeon story is, how the heck could we have done this? How could we have taken the most abundant bird in the world right down to zero without thinking about the process uh, along the way? Supposing that we'd had a gas gauge. Supposing we'd been able to actually see the annual movement of the entire population of these birds as they winter across the oak forests of the south, migrate north at the summertime uh, breeding seasons in New York, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. And supposing we had seen by 1860s, wow, there's only a half of them left. By 1875, wow, they're down to just a tenth of where they were maybe we should stop hunting them for a while and give them a chance to actually recover during a few years of, of breeding. We did not think that way, nor did we have any way of actually visualizing the entire range dynamics of a species. And until very recently, we've never had that capacity. Well, of course, the same thing happened uh, to this bird. This is the uh, Eskimo curlew, which uh, by the time the passenger pigeon had become so rare, uh, individual market hunters, in fact, whole teams of market hunters moved out to the prairies in the springtime where they harvested this bird. They even called it the prairie pigeon, uh, nicknaming it the pigeon because of, the, what their, of their memories of passenger pigeon flocks earlier. And guess what? They took this bird also right down to zero. Here's the last photograph ever taken of a live Eskimo curlew, 1962, Don Blights on the Galveston shore of Texas. We're gonna come back to a curlew story in a few minutes, because you'll see how eBird is beginning to give us a, a sense of how we can uh, manage the existing remaining species of curlews. There's a related group of birds I want to talk about briefly, which are the godwits. And this story is an absolutely incredible one because the bar-tailed godwit, which winters down in, in uh, New Zealand and the coast of Australia, breeds up in the high Arctic of Alaska and Siberia. Uh, this is the bird, uh, perhaps you've heard about, is the bird that makes the longest single flight of any bird species in the world. It's, I think, 17,000, 14,000 kilometers non-stop over a nine day period from the Seward Peninsula and uh, Western Alaska down to New Zealand. And then importantly, it, uh, all of the birds in the South stop at that one spot uh, on the coast of China before heading back to their breeding grounds uh, in the far North. And that spot is the Yellow Sea of uh, the Korean Peninsula and Eastern China. And that Yellow Sea is an incredibly rich uh, area of tidal flats. And here's a picture of uh, one of these flocks of bar-tailed godwits on the tidal flats 
uh, in the spring on their way north to the Arctic breeding grounds. Uh, this picture is an, actually an ominous one because if you see the very, very top of this picture, it looks gray, it looks like clouds up there. I'm gonna show you the whole picture. That is a dredging operation that is slowly but surely, if in fact, fairly rapidly, filling in that entire tidal flat, turning it into coastal uh, developments for a commercial uh, real estate along the coast of China. That is happening systematically and has been over the last 25 to 30 years across the entire inner coast of the Yellow Sea with the consequence that all of the 60 species of migratory shorebirds that use the Yellow Sea as their stopover ground are declining in some cases, like the bar-tailed godwit, quite rapidly. So it makes you want to stop and ask the question, passenger pigeon, yeah, that was last century. Have we actually changed our behavior? The fact is that as we began to tell this story with a bunch of partners in the, uh, along the East Asian Australasian Flyway, we made some uh, videos out of our conservation media shop. Those videos got all the way up to Xi, to the highest levels of the Chinese government. And in 2018, as a consequence of a, a bunch of partners, including Chinese conservation organizations, in part in, uh, catalyzed by the videos that we'd made of this uh, Yellow Sea story, they put a full-time moratorium on the development of the Yellow Sea coastal zones. And that moratorium is still in place. We'd like to think that's a long-term movement by China towards recognizing their international uh, responsibilities and opportunities. So humans can change behavior. That's a key point to the whole idea that birds can save the world. And this is no big secret to uh, anybody watching this, uh, this webinar. We know very well, for example, the famous story of the peregrine falcon, which uh, had essentially disappeared from the lower 48 states until we discovered that we were poisoning it as well as ourselves with DDT. We uh, changed our behavior. Uh, we did a few little simple steps for recovering this bird and it is now more common than any than at any time in probably the last 150 years across the lower 48. Uh, indeed, I'm happy to announce now exactly 50 years after the founding of the Peregrine Fund, for the first time since the 19, early 1940s, a pair of peregrine falcons successfully reared and fledged three young in Taganic Falls right here north of Ithaca, New York, where Arthur Allen took some uh, iconic photographs of peregrine falcons back in the early part of the 20th century. So that point is we can change behavior once we understand what the birds are telling us and the consequence of that is that birds uh, start to recover. There is good news in those sorts of stories. The key here now is the fact that endangered species which grab our attention and get into our uh, uh, endangered species lists are only a tiny fraction of the species out there. Consider birds like this wood thrush, which was singing right outside my house here this morning still. Uh, this is a common bird right now, but what is the wood thrush telling us over the past 50 years? It turns out that across much of its range in Eastern North America, the wood thrush has been steadily declining. Why is that? What's it telling us? Are we going to listen to what it's telling us before it's on the endangered species list? Wood thrush is, of course, not alone. There are a large number of birds across the continental North America that are undergoing one form of population decline or another. And indeed, as a consequence of a whole consortium of scientists uh, led by our Ken Rosenberg at the Lab of Ornithology, uh, we published this uh, seminal paper in Science last fall, documenting the fact that almost 30% of the breeding bird populations of 1970 have been, have, are now gone. Uh, we've lost a net of 3 billion birds in the breeding population across North America in the last 50 years. Importantly, that, uh, that curve has been pretty steady. It may actually be flattening out over the last couple of years. Uh, but very importantly, it's true of almost every one of the habitats. You can see in this, in this chart, the grassland birds are by far the worst hit. Uh, they've declined by more than 50% since 1970. But in essentially every other North American habit, habitat except for wetlands, 
bird populations have gone down steadily in the last 50 years. So there's a huge signal out there that makes us have to look at the question, what are we doing to this landscape and what could we do to the landscape to actually reverse this decline and begin to live more stably with these natural systems. Indeed, one of the most rapidly declining birds of all in North America is very familiar to everybody who's at Archbold. It's a very common bird uh, across central Florida. This is the northern flicker. Uh, in this picture, you can see that the bird is uh, showing, this is from um, the Christmas bird, bird counts. And uh, uh, this is a, I'm sorry, this is from the breeding bird survey. This bird is declining between three and 7% annually across essentially its entire range. Everywhere you see red there, this bird is declining. A big reason why this bird is declining, we think, is that humans hate dead trees and flickers are dead tree specialists. Uh, so we always uh, like to preach, uh, leave your, your snags. Disturbance is a part of the natural system and there are lots of species from small to huge that depend on disturbed habitats. Indeed, Reed Bowman and I study one of those birds, uh, very familiar to anybody who's been around the peninsula of Florida. Uh, and the story I wanna tell very quickly has to do with the, yes, the Florida scrub jay that has a close relationship with this very natural event uh, across the peninsula during the uh, summer convective thunderstorms months. When you have lightning, you have ignition, where you have fuel, you get major fires. Uh, and indeed, the lightning strike frequency of North America shows that Florida is basically the bullseye for lightning strikes. Um, and, uh, and indeed, at our, around Archbold, it's something in the order between 30 and 50 ground flashes per square mile per year. A lot of opportunity for fire and has been for the last 30 million years since as long as there's been a Florida Peninsula. Uh, where you have fire repeatedly, you have habitats that have adapted to fire. And as I think many of you know, we've been studying this flagship member of the Florida scrub community around Florida, uh, around Archbold since the early 1970s. Uh, thanks to Reed Bowman for this really lovely uh, picture of one of our banded scrub jays. Uh, there's a map uh, that shows in dark red the uh, re remnant populations of this bird as of the early 1990s. You can see the numbers declining steadily. This bird is now uh, highly endangered, although it's listed formally as just a threatened species, uh, patchily distributed across the peninsula of Florida. We've been studying it out there as particularly in that wide open area west of the main building at Archbold. Uh, we get very, very close looks at these birds, as many of you know, uh, with Molly having one of, our, one of our study animals on the top of her head there. Uh, in this slide, this is just showing you that orange rectangle is that main building you just saw. And this illustrates the fact that Florida scrub jays live in this mosaic of very, very vigorously defended territories. Each one of these polygons is a territory that contains a breeding bird, a breeding pair, uh, plus one to four helpers that help raise the uh, babies uh, the following year, as long as they stay alive. Uh, great story about the evolution of cooperative breeding. That's not our story today. Our story today has to do with this fact that we had been watching a number of scrub jay populations around the state of Florida go steadily downhill, including one very close to the main building in Archbold, when we began to hypothesize by the late 80s that there was a close relationship with fire cycles here, uh, which caused us to uh, uh, generate one of our first major long-term experiments with fire. This was in March, 1990. Picture there of Bob Curry, our postdoc at the time, escaping his experiment. And uh, our prediction was that the population, if there's a fire dependency here, the population would rebound. I think many of you know this story at this point. Indeed, the population recovered very quickly uh, and showed us that there is an eight to 10 year window of optimal conditions after a fire cycle, uh, which if the, if the fire is prohibited from re returning, you get the same downward uh, population trend exactly mirroring what we had seen prior to the first fire experiment. So when it got down to this point, of course, 
the long-term experiment continues. The obvious uh, solution is to burn it again, uh, which we did. Uh, and you can see the consequences underway now. Again, we're measuring the population response now from the fire of 10 years ago. The key point here, obviously now you're looking at a natural fire cycle within a, a natural population of birds. This bird is telling us what the original return frequency intervals were for wildfires across uh, this part of Florida. And a number of other plants and animals show us very similar stories uh, within Archbold. Archbold is in fact, as many of you are, are, are aware and some of you actually participate in, Archbold is one of the central places for studying the, uh, uh, the effects of fire and the importance of the applications of fire in conservation. So the message burn it and they will live is the fundamental message of the Florida scrub. But the fundament fundamental message of my talk today is that habitats such as the Florida scrub have built into them these relatively easily measured ecological barometers. They're called birds. The scrub jay gives us a chance to measure how well we're doing at monitoring, at measuring and managing the natural habitat according to the rules of its original evolutionary cycles. And every habitat in the world, literally, every terrestrial habitat in the world has indicator species, many of them being birds, many of them quite easily monitored and measured. In the case of the tall grass prairie, we have meadowlarks, we have prairie chickens. Uh, in the case of the southeastern pine forests, we have red cockaded woodpeckers and brown-headed nuthatches. These birds, their populations show us whether we're doing a good job or not managing those natural landscapes. So now we get to the real element here, which is how would we measure all these birds across all these landscapes, across all these continents around the world? And the answer is the fact that birds appeal to so many of us. In the case of the US, something around a third of the citizens above the age of 16 are at least casual bird watchers. That's tens of millions of individuals. That means we have a veritable army of sensors out there that are willing and able and excited about taking the data uh, that indicate how the birds are doing. The fact that we have so many of those of that army willing and able and, and excited about watching birds is a fundamental reason why there is a Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And one of our fundamental ideas is to uh, incorporate the power of birds in a variety of contexts for helping interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity. The lab itself is divided into six or seven major centers of uh, enterprise. Our conservation media group is the one that produced that information for China. We've also recently produced this uh, full length feature movie on the Philippine Eagle, which is now on a 60 city, uh, sorry, 40 city tour across the Philippines, teaching the people of the Philippines that if they're gonna preserve the last 300 of their national bird, they need to be thinking about preserving the rainforest underneath it. Um, oh yeah, there's the, one of its uh, premieres in one of the islands there with 7,000 people watching that movie. But the real uh, star of the, of the enterprise here and the, a huge backbone of the work that we're doing at the lab right now has to do with this project, which uh, had its origins in some preliminary versions in the late 1990s, just as the internet was becoming uh, usable and recognizable as a major powerhouse tool. Uh, and eBird now we recognize is beginning to come to fruition Reed mentioned early, did we, did we know how big we could, uh, we, it would get? We dreamed that it might get big enough to actually be usable. And we're now beginning to, as you'll see in just a few more slides, beginning to realize the uh, substance of that dream. The idea of eBird, I think many of you know already, allow everybody to gather and assemble their own records of birds, observations. Important in, in the eBird uh, framework is that this record of effort, how much time did you spend and how much distance did you cover? 
And uh, sorry, let's see if I can go back to that. Uh, our commitment is to archive these data forever. Never again will somebody 100 years from now say, supposing we'd had a gas gauge, because now we have gas gauges in the form of eBird data. We have uh, increasingly invested in, the, in a very important an analytical team that is now beginning to play with these data in ways that you'll see shortly. And finally, and most importantly, we're beginning, just beginning now to realize the opportunities that eBird data supply to put them into to work in conservation contexts on the ground. Reed mentioned, in fact, one of the most important uh, the landmark decisions we made around 2004, 2005, which was to stop trying to make it a citizen science project and make it a really good project for birders. And the consequence of that is that it has become the world's largest citizen science project because there are so many birders. So we can use eBird to go in and ask questions for our life list as I did in Michigan not long ago. Where can I find a Henslow Sparrow? There's the answer that year. Pop into a few places just to check that they had the identification right. Yes, indeed. There's the picture of the Henslow Sparrow. So you can find whatever you want across the world by looking where, uh, finding where people have seen these birds. You can make your trip, you can plan your trips using eBird data. And here again, what we see is there is the sensor database that we can put to use all over the world to begin to understand how birds are distributed and how they're changing. Looks to me like I'm frozen again. The, um, I'm happy to say that the uh, uh, popularity of eBird continues to grow at a rate that is uh, essentially exponential, 20 to 30% annual growth. This year with the COVID isolation, we're actually seeing an acceleration of the growth rate of eBird. This is a uh, plot uh, as of March 2020 of the spots around the world where we've received eBird checklists. You can see it's now essentially global. We'd love to cover Northern Siberia a little better than we are, uh, but around the rest of the world, we're getting an enormous amount of information coming in. And now I want, for the next few slides, I wanna show you some of the results of the, of the uh, information that's coming in in terms of how we analyze eBird data using a bunch of other distributed data sources to model bird distributions. When you look in a, a classical bird book uh, and you look at the range maps for any species, I'm showing you the rusty blackbird here, one of those species that has declined so dramatically. And you wanna find out where would I go to actually help start figuring out what's going on with the rusty blackbird. There's what the bird books tell you its range is. Breeding is in beige, migratory pathway in yellow, wintering zone in blue, but those maps don't tell you anything. They're, they are blobs. I refer to these as blobs. The next slide I show you is gonna be the historically first depiction of the actual annual range of rusty blackbirds built on eBird data modeled uh, with 200 additional variables uh, into these uh, very, very computer uh, uh, computation heavy uh, modeling systems. But there essentially is the, is the model for the breeding in red, the migratory pathways in green and the wintering grounds in blue of the rusty blackbird. And what you can see, and you can see this in every single bird distribution in the world, is that distributions are extremely heterogeneous, extremely patchy. They're not blobs at all. They are zones of high density interspersed with zones of low density or absence. And if you want to find out the real details, the dynamics of what's going on in the range of a bird that's resulting in population change, what you need is data like this. Moreover, we can, because eBird is now popular enough and, and widespread enough uh, and being practiced across the whole annual cycle, we can actually see, now, um, 
Laura, uh, Laura, I'm going to ask you if you can tell me whether this is doing that uh, blurry thing again, is it? No, it looks great. Looks good. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you the annual cycle. Sorry, I want to go back there. I'm going to show you the annual cycle of the hooded warbler. Look at that tiny breeding wintering ground range. There's its breeding ground range. This is a 52 week uh, annual cycle of the hooded warbler. You can see what I mean when I say that ranges are heterogeneous, even as they move northward. Watch it go across the Gulf and up there through. And, and if you want to study hooded warblers, now you can look at the places where you can go and find the largest densities uh, and find and uh, and the and the areas where it's absent. The consequence of this is that we can actually calculate the use days uh, of the of the, across the entire year for this species. Um, and, and one of the, the things that this has done is uh, shown us just how tiny the wintering zones are for many of these uh, widespread North American breeders. So we have begun to invest significant energy in exactly that spot, the Northern Guatemala, Belize, Southern Mexico, so-called Mayan corridor, because species after species, Here's another, another example, Magnolia warbler. Uh, we're seeing that zone being a huge hot zone for their uh, wintering grounds. There's the Magnolia warbler's breeding uh, distribution. There's the migratory pathway. You can see it coming through Florida in the fall, but not so much in the spring. If you want to see a Magnolia warbler in Florida, you're really better off looking for them in the fall. Uh, watch this migration come back down through the peninsula across the Gulf and right that back to that wintering ground there. One more species uh, that is uh, going to begin to introduce another and the most important concept of eBird. This is uh, our wonderful indigo bunting. You'll see from this map, this breeding zone is widely spread across eastern North America. The eBird map accurately shows that there's a small wintering population in South Florida. We always look for them on our Christmas counts down there. Once again, heterogeneous distributions, even within the tightly packed wintering grounds down there. Uh, and then that trans-gulf migration up to the breeding zone. The most important possible tool we can draw out of eBird is now at the very edge of being available to us, which is that we have enough years uh, accumulated in our database to be able to go through and actually calculate what the population trends are for the species that for which we have the most data. Uh, this is one of the very first population trend models we made and it was uh, a shock uh, for us to see. This is the indigo buntings breeding ground outlined in black and these are 50 kilometer uh, squares each of these zones where you see blue the population is increasing, or you say red, it's decreasing. The size of the dots represent the abundance of the bird in that square. Find the blue. These maps are beginning to show us in detail at local landscape levels, what's happening to the bird populations uh, around their ranges. I love the map of the Purple Martin uh, in talking with uh, people who love Florida because as you know, the Purple Martin is your first harbinger of spring, not that you ever really care about spring in Florida, but uh, this is a bird that winters in the Amazon. Uh, let's see it uh, first appears in Florida in January. Watch it, there's a January, then February, March, and finally April and May, it's up there where uh, us Northerners live. Uh, there's a number of things uh, captured in that annual cycle, and I've just got a couple of slides here that show you. There's that Florida arrival, the end of January. Uh, there's about the uh, you know, middle of summertime, July 12th in this case, widespread across eastern North America. Uh, by the end of August, it's already beginning to uh, become dense in very small areas on the Atlantic coast and down the Mississippi Valley. It's beginning to appear already in Yucatan. And watching this, these maps is the first time that we have recognized that essentially the entire breeding population of purple martins gathers for about a month 
in the Yucatan Peninsula and along the Honduras coast before moving on down to South America. So we're learning intricate details about the distribution and pathways of these birds. Um, there is the breeding, uh, is the uh, uh, trend map of the purple martin, uh, an interesting pattern where uh, evidently in West Texas, South Texas that is, the bird is actually growing a little bit and across the north, the small thinly distributed populations may also be slightly increasing. In the deep south, this bird, where this bird has been quite common, uh, they are actually beginning to decline fairly rapidly. This may actually be a signal of climate change where there is movement uh, northward from the uh, otherwise more southerly distribution of the species. One of our most interesting uh, and rapidly declining birds is the eastern meadowlark. Uh, here is the um, uh, annual cycle of the, of the eastern meadowlark. You can see it's uh, fairly common across the peninsular Florida. And we play its annual cycle and you see that it never actually leaves Florida. Those of you who know the bird down at the ranch, it's an abundant breeder at the ranch. Um, there is its annual uh, cycle. Again, emphasizing the fact, very heterogeneous uh, distribution. We know where we would go to understand uh, what, uh, what uh, habitat needs are for this bird. Now I'm gonna show you uh, what we had originally mapped. This was about uh, eight months ago. This was our first effort at a trend map. And I'm gonna show you now a map that nobody nobody has see, ever seen yet because this map was just produced about two weeks ago uh, and it's one of just two of the very most modern very most recent up-to-date trend analyses for the eastern meadowlark a very interesting distribution we're still studying what this uh, tells us again these dots are at 50 kilometer uh, intervals uh, you can see that the Mississippi Valley and the agricultural zones of the Midwest this bird is where this bird is most rapidly declining. A very interesting and heretofore undocumented population increase across the central and southern Great Plains. Um, just the very beginnings, we have one other species for which we've done these most recent detailed uh, models. Oh yeah, there's the map in Florida. You can see uh, in the peninsula of Florida where we are around Archbold, the bird is basically stable, if not ever so slightly increasing out there on the ranch lands of uh, South Central Florida. The one other species for which we have these most modern, most up-to-date trend analyses now available is this very interesting bird I mentioned earlier in the talk, the wood thrush. Uh, and you can see that a huge part of the population decline uh, and one of the reasons for the, for the hi highly publicized population declines is the many studies of this species that have gone on here in the Piedmont and lowland zones of the mid-Atlantic states where the bird is clearly very rapidly declining. But interestingly, the wood thrush appears to be increasing on the mountain top or mountain slope habitats of the Southern Appalachians and again, surprisingly to us, across the uh, lowlands of the Deep South. We're, again, as I mentioned, we're just beginning to get into the production of these new maps. By the end of the summer, we expect to have 100 of these spe of the most common species of North America analyzed in this way. Uh, and the consequence is gonna be that we can supply at the very local level information to uh, land managers and to biologists uh, about what's going on in the population trends in their particular area. I just wanna show you, now you can back away and think about the entire Western Hemisphere as a big migratory uh, uh, soup that uh, boils along and heads up towards the north. And for uh, now that you've seen some individual species plotted, Think about each one of these dots as a separate species. So there are 120 species on this map and each blue dot is the center of its distribution at a given week, in this case, January 8th. And I'm gonna show you the annual cycle for all 120 of those species as measured by the centroids of their habitats. Another way in which eBird is allowing us to visualize 
the heartbeat of the Earth's natural cycle. By February, they're already moving out of South America. Look at April in the Caribbean. By May, they're coming up into their breeding grounds across North America. By June, right now, they're already beginning to move back south. It isn't going to be very long before you in Florida start seeing these migratory birds heading back south from their Arctic breeding grounds uh, to their southernmost points. So the use of eBird data gives us very, very tine, tiny, fine scale um, insights about local spots, but it also allows us to back out and look at uh, global scale population uh, changes. Now, I've told you that I'd come back to the story of the curlew. There are in the world uh, about nine species of curlews, give or take a few, depending on whether you lump or split. Two of the curlews of the world are already extinct. We've already talked about the Eskimo curlew in the New World, the um, the slender build curlew of the old world, basically it's an Eskimo curlew equivalent in the old world, is also now extinct, not seen since about 1999. But every other curlew in the world is declining right now, including our own whimbrel, which is a, a common uh, Eastern North American bird. Florida bird watchers know the whimbrel uh, very well. We have now taken eBird data. Uh, uh, we are trying to uh, to work with partners to, um, to uh, develop conservation strategies for the whimbrel and where we know that our, it's very important for this bird is, uh, is wintering zones. So key to this is to understand where whimbrels winter. And what you're gonna see now is a flyover of the Western North American coast, I'm sorry, the Western hemisphere coast you're looking right now, you can't quite tell it because you're looking upside down, but that's Baja, California. And there is the Gulf of California. And what we're gonna do now is take a flyover, heading south along the west coast of first North America. We're now heading up, taking up elevation. And now we're starting to see the liberal distributions all along the coast. They're very thinly distributed all along the Mexican and Central American coast until you get to Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Panama, where you see some real concentrations of whimbrels. So if we're gonna do some work on the wintering grounds of whimbrels, we can clearly see some hot zones right there in Central America. But the real mother load, we now understand from these eBird models, the real mother load of where whimbrels winter is along the coast of Chile, and in particular along the south coast of Chile in just a few very important islands and coastal shorelines down in South Chile. So clearly it's the partners working in the conservation of the South Chilean coast that are gonna be the most important partners for uh, helping understand what we need to do to keep protecting the places that Wimbrels require uh, to overwinter successfully. Um, I'm watching the clock and I'm just going to uh, quickly say that we, there's a whole different set of data, large databases that we've been looking at using the NEXTRAD radar system. Uh, I'm not going to go through that story right now. I put this in here in case the time was uh, allowing, but I'm going to zip through it and just say that what we can do is use the NEXTRAD radar system of the U.S. to literally count the birds as they migrate north every single night through the entire spring breeding season, count them again as they come back through in the fall. Uh, and the consequence of that is we can actually measure how many birds entered the U.S. from the south in the spring. In this particular year, it was three and a half billion birds. That year, 2.6 billion birds went on up into Canada. The following fall, four billion birds came back down and 4.7 billion birds headed down to the tropics. The NEXRAD radar system is a perfect system for counting migratory birds, it turns out. What we do is we take the weather out of the data uh, and look at the really interesting biology that's included in these things. And the consequence of that is, as many of you know, we can actually make these live migration forecast maps uh, that give uh, birders a chance to predict where they're going to see the uh, most active migratory arrivals and departures. 
but in addition, it allows us to inform the various kinds of places that are creating havoc for migratory birds, such as wind energy farms like these uh, three shown. And also, we can inform cities such as Houston uh, in South Texas, one of the cities that has the brightest uh, nocturnal landscape as a consequence of the city lights. But it's also one of the cities that has the highest number of birds flying over it during fall and spring migrations. The consequence of being able to identify which actual evenings the bird density is gonna be highest during migration gives us a chance to actually inform cities such as Houston, working with our partner, Houston Audubon. We are now building these lights out alerts for the major cities of the Central Flyway so that uh, on a very few nights, the weather channels and the news hours and the radio broadcasters can say, tonight and tomorrow night, get the lights out and the consequence will be a major reduction in the mortality that happens as these birds strike the windows of these large cities. So I just want to, uh, to uh, conclude with the idea that what we started as a project to see if we could count birds accurately around the world has now evolved into a project in which our goal is nothing less than a genuinely new relationship between humans and the natural earth. This fact that birds are so powerful and so attractive to us in so many ways, and that our sensor ability is so good that by just spending a few minutes to put the information that we sense into an organized place, we can actually begin to identify the kinds of uh, needs that various landscapes have around the whole world uh, and uh, begin to generate uh, locally based uh, methods for how to maintain and improve those systems. I'm showing you here a picture that, uh, that we, Molly and I see from our deck in the fall. This is our, this is our view uh, looking due north uh, in Ithaca. Uh, just for you Floridians, I'll mention that it looks like this more often than we necessarily wish. But I want you to look at these places uh, not as Molly's in my place. You can close your eyes wherever you are distributed across North America watching this webinar. Close your eyes and think about your place because every one of you has a place. Everybody in the world has a place. And with the idea that we now have the power to encourage people to spend a few minutes and put the information that they're getting from the birds of their backyard or their schoolyards or their landscapes into a common database that allows us to actually measure in real time how the habitats are doing, that idea is gonna allow us to understand this planet in ways we never had understood it before. And after all, we gotta remember, this is our home, it's our origin. It's for many of us our house of worship. And with this kind of new relationship with the planet, we are going to be able to figure out how the heck we can fit in with all of this grandeur. And my final message to everybody in the conservation world is the message I say after every talk I give about conservation which is that we must never give up. We are not gonna win every single battle, but we cannot give up because there's gonna be a lot of battles that we will end up winning because we stuck with it and because we invented new technologies that would give us new insights about how to do the job right. And with that, I close and I'm happy to uh, take a few questions. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Fitz. Uh, wonderful, wonderful talk. And uh, I'm sure there's lots of virtual applause right now. Unfortunately, we've never figured out how to do that in a, in a Zoom thing. So um, there's some questions in the Q&A and also in the chat. If you have additional questions, um, put them in the Q&A. I'll, I'll read them for Fitz and, uh, and he'll answer. We're going to go to 445. So Fitz, uh, Scott asks, um, is it hard to extrapolate historical count numbers to current ones 
when so much has changed, probably both in the environment and how we can uh, access and, and upload data? Uh, I assume that that question addresses the, the how how we made how we made a comparison from fifty years ago to the present. Um, yeah, and just the the general decline patterns as well. Yeah. Um, well, as as many of you know, there have been only a few large scale projects that uh, allowed us to do estimate to estimate population numbers back as early as 1970. These are mainly the Christmas bird count and the breeding bird survey for North America. So the, the uh, original estimates that went into that science paper were built on those two population surveys and it required a fair amount of work to, uh, to take from those, those data, uh, to extrapolate those data, to model from those data, what those data suggest about the local densities of bird populations and then to extrapolate that across their whole range. That work was done over a period of three years by a consortium of, of scientists using the statistical techniques for doing that. The cool part of that project was is that beginning in the mid 1990s, the next rad radar data began to be available. And so completely independent of the 1970s to the present analysis, uh, Adrian Doctor was able to actually go in and do a very similar effort using NEXRAD uh, estimates of bird populations uh, annually from 1995 to the present. And his result was remarkable because it showed identical patterns of loss uh, at, the, at, the, at the large scale numbers that those NEXRAD um, data supply. So the science paper was built on several different totally independent uh, analyses that converged on a similar conclusion, namely, something around 30% fewer breeding birds at the beginning of each breeding season now compared to 1970. Thanks, Fritz. Um, so this may apply to some of the broader programs at the Cornell Lab, but um, is there anything out there or available at Cornell Lab that tells folks what they can plant in their yards or communities to help birds in their respective bird population? Yeah, great question. Uh, really, really good question. It's one of the uh, it's one of those uh, seven things that you can do uh, locally to help uh, local bird populations. Um, we are actually developing a course on exactly that topic. Uh, as some of you may know that we have a, uh, a, an extensive and growing collection of, uh, of courses, some of them being interactive type courses, other ones being webinar based, um, that uh, on our uh, website called Bird Academy. So if you're looking for this, write down birdacademy.org or Bird Academy in Cornell and you'll find uh, this list of courses. Uh, one of the courses in development is, is exactly this question, namely what, what are the best uh, plantings and best strategies for improving bird, bird, local bird populations in your property. Uh, but I will also say that uh, this is a, uh, you know, hats off to uh, Audubon and to our colleague here at the lab, Steve Kress, who's a, uh, a career-long National Audubon employee. Steve has written several books about this exact question. Uh, and so I would, uh, I would refer the, the questioner also to uh, uh, look up books by Steve Kress. I believe he has at least two, and he, he may have actually finished a third one on uh, the, the, best, the best way to encourage um, wildlife and especially birds in your backyard with plantings. But keep your keep your eyes on Bird Academy because over the next year we'll we'll have a course on that ourselves. So sticking to this sort of theme, Fitz, um, Paul asks, how can I actually become a better birder in the sense of making my data better for the science aspect of it? Um, and then I'm going to couple that with another comment from Georgia, which is. It, does, is there advice that you could give for college-bound students who are interested in ornithology? They, they probably go hand in hand a bit. Yeah, of course, this is an odd year to be asking that question, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully uh, is it Georgia? I hope, hopefully Georgia is a, is a high school sophomore or junior because this year is going to be an odd college year. Hopefully that's not going to be true forever. Um, Actually, but, you met uh, Georgia. Those, those, are, those are really, uh, really good questions. Uh, I want to address the first one because we have a very specific answer for that now. 
Uh, again, it, it, the answer goes back to Bird Academy. Go to our Bird Academy website, and there are several different uh, courses in there now. One of them is called Joy of Bird Watching. That's a very introductory course. If you're already a, a reasonably uh, competent birder, you, you probably don't need it except to refresh a few things. Uh, but there are some free uh, uh, resources on there about about eBird. So it's, I think one of them is called eBird Essentials, and it's a it's basically a how-to for uh, making sure your list is, you know, accurately done. Some of the some of the nuances that uh, will make it a better list. Very specific answer to the to the question there. Um, go to the uh, eBird Essentials list. There are also on the eBird site itself. Uh, you can go into uh, explore and read a few things about about uh, about the process. Um, and then one thing I'll say, even with as many participants as we have, the eBird uh, team uh, itself is very responsive. So if you're having confusion about some uh, feature about eBird, you can even email the, the gang directly um, and they'll, they'll respond. Um, as far as college uh, things, I think um, I, might, I might very well recommend the course called Ornithology uh, that is on our uh, Bird Academy website. Uh, that course is at, built around the textbook that we um, edited, uh, published several, I think it's 2016. Um, and uh, so, yeah, becoming familiar with, with, um, with the biology of birds. It's a lot of fun. It just gets you deeper and deeper into it. You know, fair warning, you're going to get hooked. Um, and uh, so, and, and if you're really into birds and uh, interested in uh, working in a place that uh, takes them very seriously and has a lot of resources, think about coming to Cornell University as your, uh, for your college experience. You've actually met George's daughter, Mia, in the lab. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, uh -huh. so I remember you, Mia. <laughs> you mentioned that um, you quantify effort. Um, how is that effort uh, incorporated in the relative abundance maps and, and how do you standardize birding effort given the great discrepancies among regions and seasons yeah. and things? Hugely important question and uh, the, 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 the very broad answer to that is that that's why we have an analyst team. Um, we have the, 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 the individual who's kind of the head of the team uh, named Daniel Fink, uh, who's published a, a large number of methods papers now about, uh, about the, uh, um, explaining very, in very detailed uh, fashion for the uh, ecological applications um, uh, community how he's done these, these, uh, the, developed these algorithms. Um, the, the, the effort uh, variables are extremely important. And the questioner is correct that every one of us, there's little small errors. I think that was about an hour uh, or maybe, but when it actually was actually just 50 minutes. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the, uh, the eBird app on the, on the uh, mobile phones is such a huge advance because it's actually doing all the calculations for you. You go into the eBird app, turn on, start your checklist. It's all, it's counting the minutes as you go. It's also tracking your track. So it, it, uh, you, don't, you don't need to estimate how far you've walked. The, the track actually uh, has that log. Um, so those in, in that respect, the mobile app has made the eBird data inputting uh, process a lot more accurate than the original uh, web-based one, which was just estimating. Um, another key point to make about these models is that they are, as is the case with all models, you know, including climate modeling and so on, hugely data hungry. So for species, you'll notice that the ones I showed you today, the sort of they're the kind of the, the pioneer species for uh, getting the uh, the analyses models done correctly are the ones that would for which we have a very large amount of data indigo bunting eastern meadowlark wood thrush you know they're pretty pretty widespread and quite uh, common birds those common birds allow us to get very refined in these in the developing these models and th those models then in turn can be used to be uh, to be um, 
uh, extrapolating for species that are a lot less uh, common. Um, so it's a, it's a very detailed statistical process to make these models. Uh, and then remember, we're doing them at, at the pixel level across a whole landscape. So the consequence is when these all get rolled up, every one of those annual cycle um, uh, animations that I showed you, that's between five, those are between, depending on the species, those are between 5,000 and 10 to 12,000 hours of computer time for each one of those models. Um, and the uh, trend analyses are even more uh, com computation uh, intense because of course they're actually doing those models for each of the last 10 years and then looking uh, at each pixel all the way through. So there's a huge amount of computation uh, time in those. We got some significant grants from Microsoft for a while, then from Amazon Web Service for a while. We've now, we're now right now in the process of switching the entire process over to the National Science Foundation's uh, supercomputer cloud computing facility uh, because they gave us an enormous grant for computer time to get these things done. Rich, one of the questions was about um, climate change. You, um, you showed us some observational inference about climate change based on the patterns. Is there gonna be any effort to make that more quantitative to really get at what's driving those patterns and is it truly climate change? Yeah, I mean, that's a very important question. Um, and we're, again, the, the thing to emphasize here is that we, we are, <clears throat> while we are incredibly excited, I mean, viscerally excited about how much information we are about to begin to extract from these data because of the density of data over the last 10 years, um, remember, parenthetically, that this year, 2020, we expect to get 40% more data than we got last year. And last year, we got 40% more data than the year before. So what we're, what's, we're in right now in the process of just hugely expanding the density of data that are coming in, um, that means that we're going to be able to get very precise about some of these trend calculations. And those trend calculations are going to be the essential ingredients for answering that question. Uh, and we are only literally at the very, very beginning of that. So um, I showed you a few of the preliminary trend maps, the indigo bunting one. Uh, I think I showed you in the case of the metal arc, both the old one and the new one. They're actually a little different from each other. The new one is, we think, spectacularly accurate. Once we start have getting spectacularly accurate maps like that for 100 or 200 species across North America, uh, we can begin to look for the commonalities of signal across species that will give us a sense of whether there is, as predicted by climate change models, a general northward moving of both the breeding ranges and especially for North American winters, the wintering ranges of these birds. So we're at the, we're, we're still at the kind of front edge. We can just sort of taste the possibility that it exists, that, that we're gonna be able to analyze and answer that question, but it's still, uh, it's still work in progress right now. So I, 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 the one thing I wanna underscore though is, besides all the cool stuff, and believe me, you know, watching these annual cycle maps, it's like watching fire. It's just very alluring, it's very fun. Uh, it's very informative. We learn a bunch of new things about it. Um, besides all the bird watching advantages that eBird supplies, which are, which are copious in terms of our keeping our notes and keeping scientific data in one place and so on, the key to the value of eBird is yet to come, which is building these long-term trend analyses and um, hammering them uh, so that we know that they're accurate. Uh, and therefore usable at the local scale by local land trusts, local conservation priority uh, efforts and so on. Uh, so the best I think is really still um, coming up. Um, uh, Fetz, I think it's 4.45 and I think we'll have to wrap it up. But um, 
I want to thank you, and I also want to thank all the participants. We had over 120 participants, and nice. Um, nice. I'm sorry. Yep. I'm sorry for those folks that we weren't able to get to all of your questions. There are a lot of great ones out there, yeah. and uh, we may be able to try and answer them. After. Yeah, if you can uh, keep a record of those, and we may be able to do some uh, do some answering of those offline. So, well, thank you, Fitz, very much. We. Uh, we really yeah, my pleasure. I've, uh, I, I meant to say at the very outset, for those of you who are still on here, that uh, I've enjoyed a number of these Thursday afternoon um, uh, webinars that Archibald is putting on. It's a great program. I really c congratulate uh, you, Hillary, and Laura for, uh, for, for um, managing these things and um, keep it going. It's great stuff. And uh, I'll shout out to everybody who's still on Archibald consider Archbold in your uh, annual uh, philanthropy. Um, it's a more amazing place than ever right now. Uh, and so it's, um, it, it warrants your love. Well, maybe um, Reed, I'll take over here and say Fitz, thank you very much. And thank you for that pitch as well. I'd like to give a shout out. There's still 87 folks hanging in there. So thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time and the interest in Archbold. And um, this has been an extraordinarily successful um, uh, seminar, Fitz. So my personal thanks to you and my deep gratitude to everybody who's interested enough to join us. Um, and take the message of this talk to heart. Birds can save the world. So thank you, Fitz. And Very good. Reed, My pleasure. Thanks, thanks to thank Reed you for all. moderating. Uh, for those of you whose questions we missed, uh, we're doing our best to grab them all and we will get to them. Laura, did you want to tell anybody about some upcoming events? Yes. Next Thursday, we will continue our Distinguished Speaker Series with Dr. Andrew Durso of Florida Gulf Coast University. He'll be presenting Ecology of Semi-Aquatic Snake Communities. And also on Tuesday morning at 9.30, you can tune in for our next virtual camp field trip to Archbold's Buck Island Ranch. So we'll see you all then. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.